for a lesson about the church, definitions are a good place to start. And at least in the English language, the meaning of the word church is going to depend on the context. Take uh, this statement, for example. That's such a nice church. The stained glass windows are lovely. Their church is referring to a building. But then say someone says, church was so nice today. The sermon was exactly what I needed to hear. Well, well, that's talking about an activity, the, the service that is typically held in a church building. So one more. That's such a nice church. Everyone there is so friendly. In this example, church refers to the people. It, it reminds me of a finger play. So here's the church. This is the steeple. Open the doors and out come the people. The Greek word that the New Testament uses for church is ekklesia. It carries over into English in the word ecclesiastical, which is an adjective meaning relating to the church. The basic meaning of ecclesia is a gathering of people. In the New Testament, it's used as a technical term for church as a gathering of Christians. In the Bible, church refers to people, to Christians. So you open the doors and see all the people. That's church in the Bible. The church is Christians. Just a couple of examples from the Bible. You, you can find it at the beginning of just about any of the Apostle Paul's letters. This is one from 1 Corinthians. He addresses the letter to the church of God in Corinth, but he's not writing to a building, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Again, the church is Christians. Here's another example from the book of Acts. It's describing the work of Saul before Jesus changed his life and be, he became the Apostle Paul. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. His destruction of the church didn't consist of attacking buildings, but attacking Christians. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the holy Christian church. These two adjectives describe the characteristics of God's church. It's Christian because it consists of people who put their hope in Christ, and it's holy because the Christian sins are washed away by Jesus. The Christian church doesn't consist of people who are on probation with God, and he's waiting and watching to see if they have it in them to make the cut. No, they're forgiven which means they have a, a holy status before God. Now, notice that, that we say, I believe in the holy Christian church, singular, not churches, plural. Strictly speaking, there's only one church. It consists of all people everywhere who believe in Jesus, their Savior, and they all share that same holy status before God that there is only one church. That was a big emphasis at the time the New Testament was written. And that's because many Jewish Christians were having a hard time coming to terms with Gentile Christians having the same status before God. Before Jesus came, Jews saw Gentiles as outsiders. But inside of the church or the body of Christ, there are no second-class citizens. And, and so Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And in Ephesians chapter 2, speaking specifically to the Gentile or the, or the non-Jewish Christian, he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now I'd like to make one more point about that statement in the Apostles' Creed. We say, I believe in the Holy Christian Church. We don't say that we see it, but that we believe it. Part of the reason for, for phrasing it that way is that, that membership in God's one church, it's not determined by having your name recorded on the membership roster of a Christian congregation. 
Membership in God's church is held by virtue of faith in Jesus. And since faith in Jesus is a matter of the heart, we can't determine with absolute certainty who is and who isn't a member of it. There there are unbelievers who hypocritically confess Christianity and hold outward membership in Christian institutions, but that does not mean that they are members of God's church. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, part of his Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Likewise, there may be true Christians who, on account of some extenuating circumstances, don't hold membership in a Christian institution, but but they are nevertheless members of the one holy Christian church. God hasn't equipped us to look into the hearts of others. We, We can make judgments based only on words and actions. But like the Apostle Paul assured Timothy, the Lord knows those who are his. And what is now hidden for now will will one day be revealed to all on Judgment Day. Because membership in God's church is held by virtue of of, of faith and, and because we can't look into anybody's heart but our own, Christians have long called the Christian church invisible. It's, it's not, of course, that the people themselves are invisible, but that since the faith of the heart is invisible, only God knows with certainty who the members are. Again, we can make judgments based only on the, on the basis of words and actions. But even though the church is invisible in the sense that we can't judge with all certainty who is in the church, we can know where the church is. Where the true gospel of Jesus is proclaimed, we can know that there will be Christians there. The gospel is the means by which God gives his grace. So wherever the gospel is preached, there will be people who believe in Jesus. That's the point the prophet Isaiah makes in chapter 55. He compares the word of God to precipitation. So as I read this passage, listen for the point of comparison between God's word and precipitation. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The point of comparison? Where it rains, there's life. And there is no life where there is no water. Wherever the good news of Jesus is preached, there will be life. There will be true, eternal life with Jesus. That doesn't mean that everyone who hears the gospel will believe it. Many won't. Maybe even most won't. And it might seem to Christians who are proclaiming the gospel that no one will ever believe it. But there will always be some. That's the promise God makes through Isaiah. So that we know that that telling people about Jesus isn't an exercise in futility. Even if we can't see any results. God will see that his word gives life and bears fruit. Where the gospel is preached, there the church will be. 